Okay, hello everyone. Uh, today we have the pleasure to have Nathan Beep talking to us. Nathan is an associate professor at the University of Washington and uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab. Uh, he got his PhD from the University of Calgary and he also worked in IQC and in Microsoft. And today Nathan will be talking about training fully quantum Boltzmann machines. Okay, Nathan, uh, welcome and please give us your amazing talk. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'll do my best to make it amazing. Um, for me, though, I think, you know, the most the most amazing thing about this talk is, you know, I it's amazing that I'm talking to people from the future. Right. This very seldom ends up happening because I keep thinking it's Thursday and, you know, for you guys, it's Friday. So if one of you could give me some winning lottery uh, numbers, I'd really appreciate it. I'll split it with you. But uh, in any case, the, uh, today the sun rises gonna... tomorrow, Nathan, I'll just tell you that much. <laughs> With high probability. Um, the, uh, in any case, uh, today what I'm going to be talking about is I'm going to be talking about some work that I've done with uh, Marika um, as, uh, as well as Carlos Ortiz and Leonard Wozniak on uh, training quantum Boltzmann machines. And the basic idea behind this is that at a high level, what we really want to do is we really want to be able to understand how we could possibly learn um, efficiently information about, uh, about, uh, about general quantum states. And we'd like to be able to come up with methods for not only learning this information, but also generating examples of those states that we've trained our neural networks with. And for a very long time, people struggled coming up with ways of um, doing this with high accuracy. And this work is uh, amongst the first, is actually the first to be able to give a fully end-to-end -end picture of uh, training Boltzmann machines with both hidden and visible units. Um, so we've got actually a relatively small, small group of people here. Uh, so if, if anybody ever has a burning question, please just, just, may, uh, just ask. Uh, I'd be more than happy to spend the time to, uh, to explain it. So to begin with, I mean, this perhaps isn't an exactly an appropriate uh, slide for, for the, these experts, uh, but if we're taking a look at, you know, uh, quantum computing in the first place, there's a bunch of different reasons why people are, are interested in this. Primarily, these reasons are for speed ups, be it polynomial or exponential. And also, there's a secondary benefit, which is, of course, security improvements that we can end up getting by using quantum techniques. So these are, you know, amongst the reasons why we would want to build a quantum computer in the first place. But a question that really has become uh, increasingly important is, what are the ramifications, really, that quantum computing ends up um, making for machine learning? Is in, you know, if we're imagining the artificial intelligences of the future, are they all going to be quantum powered? And if, and if not, what really are the features of artificial intelligence slash machine learning that really kind of aren't getting a substantial advantage out of quantum hardware? And for me, these are the, these are the kinds of things that I, I ideally want to be able to answer. I want to be able to really get an idea about what these ramifications will be. And also, what it even means for quantum systems to be able to learn in the first place. So those are, the, those are kind of the high level questions. But before getting into this, I, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about what machine learning is. Now, machine learning is, has got to be one of the most overloaded terms in science these days. It seems to me, if you go out and read papers, everything ranging from, you know, optimization to, you know, approximate Bayesian inference to, um, to um, even, even actually things that are practically just least squared fitting are often called machine learning. But basically what we really want with a machine learned model is we really want to be able to develop an algorithms for solving classes of problems where the quality of the predictions that the algorithm ends up making increase as, we're, as we feed them more uh, data. And this approach 
to a kind of building algorithms for solving tasks is really kind of neat because of the fact that unlike the way that we would normally do this by hand, we don't tell the computer directly how exactly to solve a particular problem. And the types of problems that we, we've got, you know, can broadly speaking be thrown into two kind of classes. The first class is a class called supervised machine learning. And so if you take a look at the slide over here on the left, I've got an example of a supervised machine learning problem where we, what we have is we have a bunch of examples of red vectors and blue vectors. And we'd like to be able to come up with a rule so that the, the computer can actually uh, classify a new example that it's never seen before. And this is called supervised because of the fact that the training data consists of kind of ground truth values. We've got a bunch of vectors that we know are blue, we've got a bunch of vectors that we know are red, and what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to come up with a rule that can predict that pattern. And so in this particular case, you can see a very simple model ends up holding. If we just draw a line through the data, um, it neatly bisects in two. Um, this actually, um, if you want to sound smart, there's a very easy way that you can do this. You can call this line that you drew in the middle a uh, support vector machine or a uh, perceptron. And then that becomes that uh, that's how you would use a quanta or sorry, a uh, machine lear uh, learning algorithm in order to be able to solve this problem just by throwing it into one of these packages, which ends up finding a separating line between the two classes. And the training process in this really is just figuring out what the equation is for that line that separates the data. But not all problems uh, that end up arising in machine learning are naturally um, supervised problems. There are many that are semi-supervised as well as totally unsupervised problems. For example, um, an in, uh, say we're taking a look at clustering data. If we look at the data on the right, we could say, all right, let's model this data as if it came from uh, three clusters. The question is, what are the three best clusters in order to be able to explain the data? I.e., how can we minimize the intra-cluster variance of this? And so there's uh, an algorithm known as k-means clustering that can be used in order to solve precisely this problem. And so by running k-means clustering on this, um, you end up getting a set of uh, cluster identifications that, as you can see by the rightmost uh, data, actually does a pretty good job of visually describing the distribution of points that we end up seeing in the leftmost one. Now, this one is unsupervised because we don't have a ground truth that we're provided about you know, what the locations of the clusters are or where the decision boundaries should be set up for the clusters. And so for that reason, yeah, it's a little bit of a different machine learning problem than the original one. But the problem, or the, um, out of all the tasks that we run into in uh, ordinary machine learning, most of them tend to be of the supervised kind. There's relatively speaking fewer uh, tasks that people want to do that are naturally unsupervised. And so um, most of the attention when you hear machine learning is kind of you know dealing with cases that look like the left over here. So that's sort of you know machine learning in a nutshell. And to give you an example, you know, of how we would end up doing this for for a, a vision tasks as a particular example, let's say we wanted to train a computer to be able to recognize handwritten digits. What we would do is we would get a training corpus of handwritten digits. In this case, these are uh, images taken from a training corpus known as the uh, MNIST repository, which are, the, and this is a supervised problem, so we feed in a bunch of examples that have known labels associated with them. We feed the, these into a computer, and we end, the computer ends up inferring from the data a, a model that ends up match, correlating between the raw image and labels. And then once you feed in a particular uh, example after training this model up, if you've done a good job with it, then hopefully with high probability, that image should be correctly read. In this case, red is four. So that's, that's the, the deal. And um, um, that's an, kind of an example of what we would be interested in doing with this.
And so if we take a look at doing um, this on a, we'd like to ideally ask, what tools can we use from uh, quantum mechanics in order to be able to accelerate these tasks? And there's a wide array of different things that we can do. But three of the kind of biggest classes that I end up seeing for people trying to use quantum, uh, quantum effects in order to be able to improve machine learning are the follow following. Uh, the first one that people try to use is amplitude amplification. Basically, the way that I think about amplitude amplification is it's really a technique for monkeying with the probability distributions that you end up getting. So it can give polynomial speed ups for problems, um, but and the way that it ends up doing it is by um, causing quantum interference between all the different possibilities that you could observe the, uh, for a particular experiment and using that in order to be able to force one outcome or a set of outcomes to happen with much higher probability. So that, that tool is, is nice and almost all of the quadratic speed ups that you end up seeing quoted in papers are because of the use of this technique at some level or another. The next one that you end up uh, frequently seeing is adiabatic optimization. The idea behind this is that what we do is we take the machine learning problem that we're trying to solve and we convert it into an energy minimization problem. So for example, you know, um, that the problem of clustering we could turn that into a problem of minimizing the energy, where the energy corresponds to the, the, the sum of the variances inside each of the clusters that you assign. So we solve the problem by, by taking the uh, uh, system first to be one that we can trivially solve and find the minimum energy configuration for. Then by slowly morphing the potential or the Hamiltonian, from what the trivial case was to the uh, actual case that we want to solve. If we do that slow enough relative to the minimum uh, energy gap for the system, we'll remain in the um, minimum energy uh, state the entire time. And so we can use this in order to be able to solve problems in machine learning that way. So this is very popular, but there's a hu some huge problems with it. The biggest problem with it is that it's very difficult in order to assess how what kinds of speed ups you're going to get from this uh, this approach, because in order to be, uh, do to do that, what you need to do is you need to have a good idea of the eigenvalue gaps, and often computing the eigenvalue gaps is harder than a problem you wanted to solve in the first place. Uh, so it's this is very nice because we can run ver variants of this on quantum annealers and near term hardware. But the downside is we really just don't have a great theoretical understanding of when or how these types of algorithms are actually going to provide any advantage. The final uh, type that we're um, of uh, speed ups that we're in, uh, interested in are kind of block encodings, which are uh, t um, basically ways of embedding linear algebra problems is as sub blocks of unitaries in higher dimensional spaces. And we can, the, the most famous example of this is the Harrow, Hassett, and Lloyd algorithm for solving linear systems of equations, which was subsequently used in order to uh, find algorithms for uh, perceptron training and other applications. So it's a fantastic example of uh, a case that formally allows for exponential speed ups but in practice has a lot of uh, issues with it. And uh, I'll go so far as to say, even though this technique promises to give exponential speed ups, to my knowledge, I haven't seen a convincing case uh, that of a protocol that actually does get exponentially sped up by this. Okay, so, there's three challenges, when, when you're thinking about uh, quantum machine learning, there's three things that I'd like to always put in your minds when you see other talks or you're considering wor uh, working with it yourself. And these three types of problems are, I, I call the input problem, the output problem, and the speed up problem. Now the input problem is, uh, is actually a, kind of an interesting one. And the input problem basically ends up saying, all right, for some of these applications, like linear system solving, we can get what looks like an exponential speed up uh, for the uh, algorithm. But the problem is, is that we still have to load all the data in. 
And if we consider the cost of loading the data into the quantum computer, these exponential speed ups can disappear completely. So that is a very important thing. And in practice, if we're searching for an exponential speed up for a uh, quantum algorithm, we really, really need to make sure that we're looking at a set of problems where the data can be inexpensively loaded in, preferably problems where the data can actually be generated by an efficient circuit. The next problem is the output problem. The output problem is kind of the obvious dual to this. So, all right, let's say we get around the problem of uh, having the input in. We also need to be able to extract information from the quantum system. Of course, every, we only get information probabilistically out from a quantum computer. So if the quantity that we need to estimate can only be learned accurately using an exponentially large number of samples, well, then we're kind of in trouble yet again. So in order, in order to have a compelling example, we need to have, uh, solve that problem. But perhaps the final and most subtle uh, problem that we run into when thinking about um, how to get substantial speed ups using quantum machine learning is kind of this speed up or benchmarking problem. And the problem is, okay, well, if we see a speed up, how do we know that we actually are getting a speed up relative to all classical algorithms or even what the uh, quantum algorithms classical analog is? Because it turns out that finding the classical analog for many of these algorithms is in entirely unobvious. An example of this is if you take a look back at uh, some of the early papers uh, in um, the quantum machine learning uh, literature, some of them ended up claiming exponential speed ups for problems such as uh, nearest centroid classification, which basically what it did is it used uh, a quantum computer in order to be able to load um, vectors in and compute the distances between them, effectively using a swap test. The problem is, is that they said, okay, this process, it doesn't require you to look at a large number of components of the vector. So this will actually work for exponentially large vectors, which sounds great. And if you wanted to compute, you know, distances between vectors ordinarily using conventional methods, you'd imagine you're going to have to loop through all of them. So with classical methods, you might think it'll require time order two to the n, but quantumly, it'll require time that goes like some variance uh, divided by epsilon squared or square root. Yeah, actually. And um, the problem is, is that that isn't the natural um, analog. And it turns out that often, and in that case in particular, there exist stochastic ways that we, you can compute the, di uh, the distance that are actually polynomially equivalent to the quantum algorithms. And this point was uh, articulated um, very nicely in some of the subsequent work. Um, so let me just skip this. The Yuan Tang, who's also a, uh, just started her PhD actually at the University of Washington, uh, really did a fantastic job of, um, of explaining what these problems are. And in part, the biggest issue that, that she ends up raising in her work is that when we're building quantum algorithms for machine learning, we really have to uh, compare up against stochastic classical algorithms, because in many cases, the performance of them is very close to what we would end up seeing from quantum algorithms. And this was actually a real big shakeup for quantum machine learning, because for a long time, many of the people in the space had pushed to try to find these exponential speed ups for problems in quote unquote big data. But the, this work cast doubt on that to the point where many people started wondering, are there any natural examples where we can get an exponential speed up uh, for classical data? And to date, we really just don't know. So, what sorts of results have we found so far? Well, one of the big results that ends, ended up uh, suggesting that uh, uh, quantum may not necessarily uh, be immediately amenable to classical machine learning problems, it came in the form of uh, PAC learning results. Originally, um, PAC, these results, where PAC stands for probably approximately correct, 
um, were pre uh, presented by uh, Rocco Cervetio uh, from Colombia. And um, uh, further elaborated on by Srinivas and Arunalacham and Ronald DeWolf. And the results basically end up, ended up giving a no-go theorem that ends up saying that under certain assumptions of how you're allowed to interact with the quantum data, or the quantum version of the training data that's coming in, you can actually at best get a constant factor speed up uh, or reduction in a number of uh, accesses you need to the data to learn um, a model. And that is a huge, huge negative result because ideally you'd like to be able to see exponential reductions, not constant factor reductions in them. However, it's limited to kind of a streaming model where the quantum data is fed in in a um, incoherent manner. If you have coherent access to the data, then this uh, uh, theorem doesn't hold. But it nonetheless ends up, you know, casting a little bit of doubt about this. The other uh, issue is that basically um, every approach that people have found so far that seem to end up giving an exponential speed up for classical data, all of them have been uh, dequantized um, using techniques like those that Ewan presented in that previous paper that I had up. The final thing that people are, are, are kind of interested in is there's this question about what the expressive power of quantum models are. And maybe quantum models might have the ability to represent stronger correlations than what we could easily do classically. And while that intuition is, is reasonable, unfortunately, nobody's really provided yet a compelling argument for why that intuition would necessarily end up applying for classical data. So this is one of the, the challenges that, these are the challenges that we've run into uh, with this. And so because of that, I've kind of, you know, begun looking less so at uh, quantum machine learning for um, speed ups for classical learning problems, but rather I've been looking at it as a, as a way to ask, how can we learn information about, about quantum states themselves? And also ideally, what I'd like to, to have a good understanding about one day is what it really even means for, uh, for quantum systems to learn about each other. And one of the, what I think is one of the most promising and in turn, one of the most simple techniques that, that can be used in order to be able to study quantum machine learning at this level and answer some of the questions about what, how much promise it ends up holding for learning quantum data is uh, given by the Boltzmann machine, which is the, the topic of uh, my talk today. So before I start with the Boltzmann machine, does anybody have any questions? Okay, looks like I was entirely too clear with this. Uh, I'll, don't worry, I'll get far less clear going on. So Boltzmann machines are an example of, um, of what are known as recurrent neural networks. And these are, Boltzmann machines are, uh, can be used as a form of deep learning. Now, deep learning, I'm sure many of you have heard about uh, in recent years. And the idea behind this is to come up with a hierarchical model uh, for the data that you're seeing. And instead of trying to classify data uh, based on the raw input that ends up coming in, the classification is made uh, from higher level features that are extracted uh, through, in some cases, many layers of abstraction from the, the raw data that's coming in. So for example, you know, let's say I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to be a detect car, uh, detect a car in an image my raw data coming in would be the image. So I'd feed that into neurons, uh, symbolizes these circles down at the bottom. You can envision them I, you know, for our purposes as just bits, okay? So all the bits are fed into the bottom of this network. Then the idea is the network ends up uh, learning higher level uh, features from these. For example, you know, it might take those pixels and it could learn edges. Then it could combine those edges together in order to be able to learn textures that make up the surface of the car. 
And then from those, it could end up inferring um, object properties as higher level things. And then the decision about whether this is a car or not will entirely be based on those higher level properties that it's inferred. Like for example, are there wheels on it? Or is there a rear view mirror? All of those concepts are very distant conceptually from the raw image data that's fed in. So that is basically how deep learning works. And a lot of its intuition behind it is really trying to mimic how you or I might decide, you know, how we classify particular objects. Like, you know, I, I, I know that this is one of my many empty cans of Coke by my computer. Um, but why do I know that this is a can of Coke? Well, when I start going through the decision tree that uh, I kind of implicitly um, have, I'm basing that decision on the on abstract features rather than the raw data that's hitting my eyes. And so with deep learning, we try to do the exact same thing. And by the way, these people on the right are three of the kind of big heroes of this. Uh, Yashua Bengio, Jeff Hinton, and Yen LeCun, who um, uh, ended up popularizing this and developing the mathematical techniques needed in order to be able to train these models, i.e. build the right correlations between the data at each of these levels of abstraction. By the way, I should also mention that these particular feature, higher level features that are inferred from the raw data or the low level features and so on and so forth, these things, we don't tell the model what things to look for. The idea basically behind this is that a gradient descent process ends up giving you what the best things to look for are. And part of the success of deep learning has been from the, our ability to easily compute gradients using uh, this backpropagation algorithm, which is just a fancy way of saying the chain rule, and, and also having computers that are fast enough in order to be able to loop over all of this for large training sets. So that's sort of what uh, uh, ended up leading to this. Now, if we take a look at Boltzmann machines, and I apologize for people who've heard me uh, make this joke before, but it's too good, so I'll have to do it again. So the Boltzmann machine basically is a particular form of a neural network that's strongly related to physics. And it's so related to physics that actually many of you probably actually can kind of implicitly under, uh, understand what's, uh, what's going on with the Boltzmann machine, even if you've never seen any machine learning beforehand. The basic idea is what we do is we model the input data as if it ended up coming from an Ising model in thermal equilibrium. So what we do is we say the probability um, of the model generating some bit string is proportional to e to the minus the energy of the bit string, okay? And so that's how the, the whole thing uh, works. What we do is we define an energy function on a graph where here, these first la uh, layer of dots, we can just think of as the bits, where that uh, hold the um, bits of the raw image that are being fed in. And these dots at the second level correspond to the high, uh, some higher level features that are used for classification. And this final dot at the end, you can think of as just a bit that is zero or one, that stores whether the, the image is a cat or not a cat. And by the way, all of these edges in the graph are weighted. So just like an Ising model, all of these will have some energy bonus or penalty assigned to it. So if there's an edge between these two and both of them are one, there'll be some penalty set by the weight of the edge for them both being one or some energy bonus if you flip the sign. So that's the whole idea of uh, Boltzmann machines. And the essence of it is that we want to uh, be able to classify data effectively by changing the Hamiltonian for the Ising model to make the energy of the correct configurations low, but the energy of the incorrect configurations high. So for example, if we correctly label this image of a cat as a cat, then we should assign a low energy to that. Um, if we incorrectly uh, say that a cat is not a cat, there should be a high energy associated with that decision, i.e. there should be a very low probability 
that the bolts of the machine ends up uh, uh, coming up with the wrong decision. And, you know, if you're feeding in an image of a Pomeranian, well, that's kind of cat-like. So you should probably, there should be an energy penalty for saying the Pomeranian's a cat, but um, um, perhaps not that much of one. Um, I should mention that you, that this problem of cat identification is, of course, one of the most important problems in machine learning. And, you know, I, I, I wish I was joking there, and this, this had been chosen because of some cute uh, analogy to Schrodinger's cat, but actually it turns out that cats are, uh, many of the, the training corpuses that we end up taking a look at, like ImageNet, are pop, uh, populated by stills from YouTube videos. And so many, uh, because YouTube videos are disproportionately made out of cats, um, well, okay, contain videos of cats, not made out of them clearly. Um, but the, um, because of that, many of the models that are most performant on the data set actually have incredibly good models of cats. So it's not an exaggeration to say that the cat identification problem is actually probably one of the most important problems in machine learning just because of people on the internet. So in any case, that's the basic idea behind it. The question is, all right, well, what are we trying to minimize? What we'd like to be able to do is we'd like this model to be able to ideally generate uh, new examples of images of cats uh, based on uh, all of the examples that it's seen before. And so the way the loss function that we're trying to minimize is formally speaking the KL divergence between the probability distribution it generates and the training data set that, uh, that was put into it uh, when viewed as a probability. And so the KL divergence, what it is, is it is sort of the natural, a natural information theoretic distance measure. It ends up giving you how many additional bits of information that you end up needing uh, in order to be able to distinguish between two signals. So that is, um, so, what we ideally want is we want the KL divergence to be as small as possible between the output and the input distribution, which is why what we try to do is we try to find the weights for our Ising model, i.e. the energy penalties that minimize this distance. Okay, so that is basically the long and the short of it. And the minimization process, I should mention, actually something really kind of neat comes about from it. Because of the fact that the KL divergence has a log logarithmic term in it, and the probability goes like an exponential, it turns out that we can actually find analytic derivatives for um, the weights. So we can end up finding the weights that um, are the change in the weights that we should end up making in order to uh, minimize the KL divergence between the two. And when we go through this process, which is usually done using a um, Markov chain Monte Carlo method known as contrastive divergence, we end up actually doing, getting a pretty good, doing a pretty good job of modeling input data. So this is um, data that was provided in uh, a paper by Jeff Hinton and uh, Ruslan uh, Salakudinov. And uh, this shows some examples of training images of uh, small little toys that were loaded into a Boltzmann machine versus the generated images that pop out the other side. And while you can see some graininess with the generated images, it's very, very easy to see that, yeah, actually these are matching the, uh, the form of the images that, uh, that it was trained with. And on top of that, it actually doesn't ever completely replicate any of the examples that it was trained with. So that's uh, one of the things that's really kind of neat about uh, about the uh, Boltzmann machine. Okay, cool. Um, so why would people use them? Well, in the early days of machine learning, the Boltzmann machine was one of the most popular uh, approaches to it. The reason why is that it was actually very difficult back in the day for people to be able to find the gradients for the weights for ordinary uh, neural networks. So what they would do is they would train a Boltzmann machine to kind of get in the vicinity of being able to produce the data. And the reason why they would end up doing this is because of the fact that they can end up uh, finding analytical uh, gradients of the uh, derivative of the KL divergence, or sorry, the analytic uh, gradient of the KL divergence. And 
the reason why I, I, I really gravitated towards Boltzmann machines for quantum machine learning is that it's physics based, right? So in order for us to be able to easily map a model from a, a machine learning model for, that is commonly used in ordinary computers over to a quantum computer, it's really helpful if we can actually have some direct link between the language that's used on one side and the other. In the case of the Boltzmann machine, because of the fact that it's just a Ising model in thermal equilibrium, if we wanted to implement that on a quantum computer, we would really just get the quantum bits to correspond to the bits in the Ising model and then construct a thermal state over them using the quantum computer. So that ends up uh, uh, being an example of that. Also, it ended up getting a great uh, interest from people like D-Wave because, uh, you know, if there's one thing the D-Wave system is very good at, it's preparing thermal states for large-scale Ising models. And um, the, so applications uh, of this in uh, Boltzmann training were, were really, really interesting to begin with. And so that's one of the reasons why we're taking, taking a look at this. And actually, I'm going to argue that some of these features of Boltzmann machines actually should be revisited, I think, now in quantum machine learning in light of some recent developments about the difficulty of training generic mo uh, models. And so this uh, particular uh, result that I'm alluding to is this Baron Plateau's result that was put out by uh, Jared McLean from Google, as well as a bunch of other uh, contributors. And what the, the gist of the Baron Plateau's uh, result is, is that if you end up getting some random quantum circuit that you end up using in order to try to act like a neural network or a model for your particular data, what ends up happening in practice is that there's a concentration of, of measure for the energy that's predicted by it, i.e. for the natural loss function that, mo that people are optimizing, like classification accuracy, for example. So basically what they end up uh, seeing from this is that in the limit as the systems end up getting bigger and bigger and bigger, the gradients will exponentially end up going to zero. You can see this actually from the, the plot on the left, which shows a semi-log plot. Uh, and it is a clearly exponential um, distribution that we end up seeing uh, from this. And so in part, this is just because of the fact that if you have some really random state, the average energy that which is, you know, uh, in the case of quantum machine learning would correspond to something like the average classification error rate that will tend to end up concentrating around a particular value. And we'll, we'll need a ton of samples, exponentially many, in order to be able to get out of these regions and get close to a location where the um, uh, solution is. So one of the, the ways that you know, we sidestepped these types of problems in the early days of, uh, of machine learning was to use generative uh, pre-training, as I mentioned. And so, and the reason uh, that these, many of these generative models ended up working so well is because of the fact that they can sidestep some of these issues about uh, evaluating the, um, evaluating the discriminative training function. Instead, we could end up taking a look at something which is like a log likelihood or log probability. And so even if your probabilities are exponentially small, the log of that isn't a small quantity whatsoever. And by using these models in order to follow the gradients of the log likelihood, we end up often transitioning from this regime where the gradients are nearly zero for, for our initial configurations to a situation where the gradients are actually large and we can follow to get in the vicinity of a good solution. So that's one of the reasons why I'm thinking, I think that perhaps maybe it's time for us to begin to revisit a generative models and this notion of generative pre-training for quantum models, because it's one of the most valuable tools that we've had in the past for getting around this barren plateaus problem classically, which is now also rearing its ugly head quantumly. Okay, so that is that. Is that. So if we want to use 
uh, both spin machines in order to be able to get around this barren plateaus problem for learning on actual raw quantum data, which, as I said before, is probably going to be our best hope for a substantial improvement for machine learning. We really kind of need to ask some questions about what the quantum analog naturally is going to be of the classical Boltzmann machine. So classically, what we have normally is we've got a training set. We've got a set of vectors that we load in uh, to the model in order to be able to kind of learn correlations between them. The natural analog uh, uh, with that in quantum world would be a quantum density operator uh, for a corresponding to the training set. And uh, with the classical Boltzmann machine, we have an energy function. But in the quantum land, of course, we're not limited to just classical models like the Ising model. We can have a generic quantum model that's described by a Hamiltonian matrix. Classically, the correct uh, 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 way to talk about the distance between the input and, uh, or the training data and the data set that's generated by the uh, quantum computer or the classical computer in the, that case would be the KL divergence. Now, there's actually a, a couple of analogs that could be used for the KL divergence, but the most natural one is the quantum relative entropy uh, between the two distributions. And so this gives us kind of a lookup table for how to go between everything that we saw in classical land and map it over to the quantum case. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow exactly this same protocol in order to be able to quantize the classical Boltzmann machine. Uh, any questions before I continue? So uh, Nathan, I have a question. Um, yeah. So in the in this um, Rosetta Stone here, um, I guess on the on the quantum side, you have extra things like coherence and um, you know measurement collapse and things. Do those are are you going to talk about those, or is there like a reverse mapping that goes back to the classical? Um, yeah. So one of the things that um, that ends up uh, I, I'm going to be talking about some of this. It turns out that actually this link between classical and quantum isn't quite as clear as it might seem. And it turns out that actually the role of hidden units in quantum is much more subtle. Um, to give a little bit of a preview, basically hidden units start acting like a bath for the uh, quantum bits that you have inside of it. And when you trace over them, that ends up leading to decoherence that causes your system to basically become classical in a hurry. So there's some, a lot of subtleties that end up coming in, coming in with that. But we're not really, uh, in this, this case, kind of using active measurement as a part of the protocol. If we were, uh, then that would definitely be relevant. Uh, when it comes to noise and things like that, the effectively you can view the, the, the impact of noise as just generating a thermal state for a different Hamiltonian than the one that you wanted. So from that perspective, it doesn't qualitatively change anything. It just causes you to be training your model with a different Hamiltonian than what you intended. Okay, thanks. Um, nope. Maybe just, you don't have to answer this question because uh, maybe it's going to have a long answer or it will be answered already. But I'm just thinking like, how would I, is there going to be a coherent way to calculate the relative entropy between two distributions or how, how do you do that with so that? All right, so I can, I can, I can, I can give you that. So um, basically the, the, the way that we do this generally is that we, we typically won't compute the, the relative entropy between two distributions. The reason why is that in order to do, compute the relative entropy, it turns out we need to compute a log partition function. And that's a computationally very hard task. So instead what we do is we actually will work with an, uh, analytic derivatives of the relative entropy and then uh, optimize those. So in practice, for most of our, the protocols that, we, that I'm going to be talking about, we won't actually need to compute the quantum relative entropy, which is fantastic because the quantum relative entropy just sucks to compute. Right. All right. Thanks. No problem. Anything else? Cool. All right. So 
Um, but there's a couple of challenges that uh, end up uh, coming into this uh, because the first thing is when we do this quantization, our Hamiltonian is going to consist of now of a bunch of matrices that don't commute. And this ma it makes finding the gradients a lot more fun, um, but, and which I'll get to later. But one other feature that I wanted to mention that's qualitatively different when we have uh, a bunch of non-commuting matrices is in the classical case, the only thing that we could do in order to be able to affect our probability distribution was to change the energy of all of the different configurations. But if we've got a quantum Hamiltonian, we also have this new freedom where we can change kind of the basis that we're representing the problem. So in this case, what we can do is we have an extra degree of freedom that we can use in order to be able to help the system decide whether um, a cat indeed is a cat or a possum. So this is uh, one of the interesting things. The other thing that I, I should mention is that actually you can end up showing that evaluating and in turn training these models is, uh, is in some cases BQP complete meaning that you can embed an arbitrary quantum ca uh, calculation in a quantum Boltzmann machine. And so this is one of the, the reasons why um, we know that um, uh, Yuan Tang's criticisms about quantum Boltzmann machines are very unlikely to hold up. Because if it were possible in general to be able to simulate training an arbitrary quantum bo uh, Boltzmann machine, then we'd be able to simulate quantum computing uh, or quantum computer in the first place. And the basic idea behind this approach is what we do is if we're not given any restrictions on the form of the Hamiltonian that we, 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 we can use for our quantum Boltzmann machine, then okay, let's use a, let's use a weird example. Let's use one from adiabatic quantum computing. From adiabatic quantum computing, we're given these examples of these kind of or what are called clock state Hamiltonians, where the ground state of the Hamiltonian basically corresponds to a quantum, um, the state that you would see from a quantum circuit after applying gates up to a fixed time. So essentially what you can do with, uh, with this is the ground state of it ends up corresponding to the, um, ends up corresponding to the quantum calculation. And in turn, being able to sample from that allows us to sample from, you know, the output distribution from any quantum computer. So we can, if we were able to uh, classically simulate this, what we could do is we could simulate any quantum calculation and then we'd have BP BPP equals BQP, which uh, nobody believes to be true, or at least very few people who aren't Gil Kali believe to be true. So that is one of the reasons why we suspect this model is, uh, is powerful. Now, to train it, what we want to do is we want to be able to um, basically do gradient descent on the relative entropy. So like Chris mentioned earlier, the most natural way of doing this would be divided differences. But actually, what we can do is we can note that the, um, that for the case where we're, um, we're just, um, where we have no hidden units, it turns out there's a relatively natural expression that we end up getting by doing all the matrix calculus. I should mention that while this uh, work in here makes it look like we can just use our ordinary tricks with derivatives, it turns out that there's a bunch of steps in here that are entirely unobvious. Like, uh, for example, uh, figuring out how to um, differentiate each of these e to the minus uh, sum over j uh, w j h j's because uh, you need to use Duhamel's formula uh, in order to be able to do this. You can't use the chain rule because the chain rule doesn't work for uh, operator exponentials, it turns out. But in any case, when you end up doing this, what you end up finding is that the derivative of the relative entropy is actually just uh, equal to the difference between the expe expectation value of one of the Hamiltonian terms in the data generated from the model and the expectation value of the same term from it generated in the data. So that is, uh, that is how we end up finding the gradient. And so just by going through, 
generating thermal states on the quantum computer and computing these averages, we can estimate the gradient. And going back to Chris's uh, um, point, we actually, again, for these thermal averages that correspond to the gradient in the bottom line, we don't need to know the relative entropy for that. All we need to be able to do is sample from the thermal uh, distribution in order to be able to do that. So this means that we don't actually have to compute the relative entropy in order to be able to find the gradient. Okay, and you can do this in polynomial time, um, just trivially. To give you an example of uh, how this works, this is uh, some data from uh, the paper, a paper uh, Marika and I put out now, now a couple of years back, where what we do is we train an all visible quantum Boltzmann machine, meaning there's no hidden units to it at all, uh, for a number of epochs. On the right, you see the, the target state that we're trying to get the, the system to be able to generate. And the bars on the left at one epoch, three epochs, and five epochs are at various steps of the uh, gradient uh, optimization uh, algorithm. And so you can see that after five epochs, at least on the graphs that, uh, that you see here, the density operators that, uh, that are being generated, at least the, the absolute values of the components of the density operators, are graphically indistinguishable from those of the target states on the right that we're trying to do. So relatively quickly, actually these, these quantum Boltzmann machines are capable of generating really accurate models for the underlying data. So this is something that we did that was actually, actually gave us a lot of hope. And this was, to our knowledge, the first example of anybody training a proper quantum distribution according to the relative entropy. Earlier work by uh, Mohammed Amin and collaborators at D-Wave um, ended up proposing training of quantum Boltzmann machines, but they weren't able to um, find an analytic expression for the gradient because they didn't, um, they didn't recognize that quantum relative entropy was the right concept here and instead tried to use KL divergence. And that prevented them, it turns out, from actually learning any of the quantum terms in their Hamiltonian. They had to just blindly guess. So this was the first example of that. And a natural question we asked ourselves well, after doing this is, okay, well, how well does this end up actually um, working compared to classical? And so when we took a look at the data, we ran into something that fascinated me for years. And it's actually only very recently that I understood this, this data. So what happened is we modified our model to add in um, hidden units. So we started adding in some extra uh, qubits into our Hamiltonian that we trace over in order to um, model the data. And it, classically, the more hidden units you end up applying, kind of, you know, it, it's like the benefits that you get from deep learning. You can have richer abstractions that, you, that you're, you're using for this. So when we take a look at the KL divergence between the uh, classical state output by this, one of the things we notice is that as we increase the number of hidden units, our classical model starts doing a lot better. But the quantum model doesn't. No matter how many um, uh, hidden units we threw at the problem, for some reason, even given all those extra parameters, the quantum model did not seem to be doing any better in complete defiance of our expectations from classical machine learning. So in part, there was this question, what the heck is going on with quantum uh, machine learning? And in turn, what's the role of hidden units there? And do we need to rethink how deep learning works if we're, we're seeing, empirically at least, that hidden units are not actually giving us more powerful models? Okay, and well, I'll skip this slide because I'm probably running out of time. But Basically, the way that we um, end up uh, doing this is that we can really actually think about the case where we have hidden units uh, in the following way, right? So imagine we've got our training data that we're feeding in to the quantum system over here. We end up feeding that into its visible units, and then we allow the system to kind of like thermalize and we end up getting some conditional distribution over all of these hidden units, which we then want to ignore. 
that ignoring in quantum language corresponds to a partial trace over that subsystem. So the correct expression for the quantum relative entropy in the case of hidden units is subtly a little bit different rather than it being the trace of rho log uh, e to the h over z, now we've got to put a uh, partial trace inside the logarithm. And things get a lot more fun when you do that. The reason why they get so, so much fun is that what you have now in this particular, particular case is you've now got a, the problem of differentiating a matrix logarithm of a partial trace of a thermal state. And that problem is tough. It's very, very difficult in order to be able to do this because you cannot use the chain rule anymore. And instead you end up getting these messy integral expressions for the derivative of the logarithm, matrix logarithm and the partial trace of the exponential. So it's entirely uh, uh, unclear how, how exactly we should go about doing this. And this is, you know, again, um, summarized by this, this problem is that effectively, if the partial, the log of the partial trace were equal to the partial trace of the logarithm, this would be easy because the logarithm would bring, we're acting on e to the h, would just bring down the h, right? And then we would have kind of like an expectation value, the Hamiltonian, like we had before but the logarithm of partial trace is not equal to the partial trace of the logarithm. So we can't do that in this case. And as I said before, the next th problem is that we cannot use the chain rule because the chain rule does not apply in cases where the object that you're looking at uh, doesn't commute with its own derivative. So we, we have to use much more sophisticated math to do this. So these are some of the mathematical challenges that had to be overcome in order for us to, to begin to understand how to train models with hidden units. But there's actually some interesting um, uh, um, further problems that I alluded to uh, in Chris's comment. This additional problem is that actually entanglement normally we think about as being one of the great powers that quantum ends up bringing to the, the table. But actually, in this context, entanglement can be more of a curse than a blessing. And the reason why is that, basically, if we end up uh, going through the um, um, calculation, let's just assume for the, the sake of argument that the Hamiltonian that we end up using has uh, statistics that are uh, kind of typical of a random matrix, like a Gaussian unitary matrix. If we go through the analysis and we take a look at the partial trace of this, uh, of this quantum state that we would end up getting uh, for any of the eigenvectors of this matrix, we end up seeing that the partial trace of each of those is basically the maximally mixed state plus exponentially small corrections. So what that ends up meaning is that actually, in a limit of high dimension, the hidden units for these uh, uh, types of matri uh, matrices utterly, utterly kill the model. So what's happening? Why is that the case intuitively? So in order to get an understanding of that, let's flip back. I want to get an image of a yeah, this one's probably pretty good. So why is this such a big deal? Well, there's a subtle point that we, uh, that we didn't realize with uh, deep learning. And that subtle point is in deep learning, there's a tacit assumption. And that assumption is that the information that we need to be able to make decisions is local. So, I.e., the, all the information stored in the model is stored in the values of the individual bits in the low level features and the high level features and the mid level features. And that's what justifies taking this partial trace. We, uh, because all the information is really is localized in this case. But when we have entanglement, the information is no longer localized. Instead, it's stored in the correlations between the bits. And when we perform a partial trace, we're throwing away those correlations that hold the entirety of the data.
So going through to our mysterious example that Marika and I had ran into years ago, all of a sudden things started making sense. In this case, we didn't limit our interactions uh, between the visible and the hidden units to, uh, in such a way as to prevent the growth of entanglement. As we increased the number of hidden units, we got more degrees of freedom, which gave us more power. But on the other hand, we got, in some sense, more effective decoherence by tracing over all of those extra qubits. And in the end, at least in the cases that we were looking at, these two tendencies turned out to be a wash. And this is, this is why this, uh, this effect here ends up happening. And in turn, why we believe that we should, that we'll often need to rethink the role of hidden units inside quantum neural networks, because this property can utterly kill you if entanglement ends up growing out of control. Any questions? Nathan? Yeah. Um, I want to follow up on Chris's question. So the computation of um, the, um, the relative entropy. So even though that you explained that um, you compute the derivative, but um, like the expression you have is um, average value of the Hamiltonian on the state, like the-, the Yeah. And, but like the state is still hard to prepare, right? It's uh, expression. Ah, uh, thank you very much. Yes, this is, this is a problem. So the states that we're preparing are thermal states, right? And in general, if we could easily prepare a thermal state, then we would have that BQP equals QMA. Yeah. And um, that would, that's probably not true. Mm. So um, yes, there is this problem about uh, preparing the thermal state. Now, there's a number of, of particular thermal state preparation algorithms that can, that can be used in order to, to do this. And they're efficient under a number of different circumstances. The, First and the easiest ones are uh, efficient under the circumstance that you're dealing with a high temperature thermal state, which probably isn't what we're looking at here, but those are the easiest ones to work with theoretically. The next are based on uh, quantum walk algorithms and they end up scaling kind of like the spectral gap of the walk operator. And so in the case where the spectral gap is large, then those methods will work well. But if it's not, then we run into some problems. So the development of, of efficient methods to create an actual thermal state is very important. But something that heuristically, of course, is worth bearing in mind is that in the classical case, what's used is contrastive divergence one training, which is like the crudest possible approximation to the classical uh, uh, thermal state that basically just involves like a two-step Markov chain to estimate the, the probabilities. And that actually empirically ends up performing extremely well. So in practice, actually, it's quite likely that in the event that we end up having errors in our uh, preparation process, we'll still be able to follow the gradients of this through and come up with a perhaps suboptimal expression for or a suboptimal model, but we'll still be able to follow the gradients towards a model. Mm. So yeah, it, but it, I, I, I have to concede that that is one of the big open questions uh, is, yeah, how, how exactly do we prepare these quantum states? Thanks. Any further questions? Nathan, yeah. um, I, I can't help but think when, when you're talking about, um, you know, the environment and uh, how many degrees of freedom you're kind of connecting that you're visible in layers to of like um, decoherent suppression techniques or decoupling techniques. Have you <laughs> thought about how this might connect? Yeah, you know what? We, we talked about this. We actually haven't figured out good ways of um, thinking about ideas from dynamical decoupling uh, to put it in yet. Um, to, to fast forward a little bit, the approach that we dealt with was to actually just change our model so that the 
Hamiltonian uh, acting on our, our hidden units always commutes. And in that case, you, you, you can show that no entanglement is actually built up. Right. Right. And so that, that's the brute force way that we solve this problem. But yeah, you know, actually, naturally, this system does lend itself to be thought of as an open quantum system. And so I, I, I really wouldn't be surprised if there's similar intuitions from control that could be used. Mm, very exciting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, cool. So let me jump ahead. So uh, here, by the way, is a uh, example of um, the uh, data. So this is a, an example of what ends up happening when we have six and 10 hidden units as well as one visible unit. And it's an extreme case, but we wanted to give a, a numerical example showing what ends up happening for the trace distance between the maximally mixed state and the, um, and the partial trace uh, over the hidden units for this, uh, this system. And as you can see, as the number of um, hidden units ends up increasing, the trace distance becomes concentrated um, near zero. So it starts becoming more and more like the maximally mixed state, i.e. the system decoheres much more substantially as we're tracing over a larger and larger bath. So this is, this is a serious problem. And as I mentioned in the, the question uh, to this, one of the things that we can do is we can think about our system uh, using open quantum system language. So we can envision our Hamiltonian now is written in the form of a visible Hamiltonian plus a hidden Hamiltonian and the interaction Hamiltonian. And what we're going to do is we're going to constrain our Hamiltonian such that the visible um, Hamiltonian ends up uh, commuting with the um, hidden Hamiltonian. And also the interaction Hamiltonian ends up commuting with a hidden Hamiltonian. However, the interaction Hamiltonian need not commute with a visible Hamiltonian. So, when we end up doing this, we can actually take a look at the eigenvectors for this uh, I, uh, a matrix of this particular form. And under the assumption that they uh, commute, you can, get, you can show that the eigenvectors can always be chosen in such a way so that the eigenvectors are unentangled, which shows that you can, we, we can get around this problem of the partial trace. So this ends, is one way of killing all of the entanglement. And, so what this actually, I should mention, um, and this is an example of a restricted quantum Boltzmann machine, but I should say that the, this restricted quantum Boltzmann machine that has only commuting terms on the hidden uh, subspace, it is, um, what it does is it actually breaks the symmetry that we had for ordinary neural networks between hidden and visible units. So what it does is it's actually telling us that these two things are serving a different role. The visible units are being used largely in order to set the basis for the eigenbasis for the input data. The hidden units are only being used to generate energy penalties for the different configurations. And so by breaking this symmetry between what, uh, what they're doing, we actually um, uh, get around this decoherence problem and all of a sudden gain the ability to train models with hidden units in a, in a profitable way. Um, I should mention that, yeah, uh, when we end up going through this um, derivative for the re uh, relative entropy, it turns out you can actually end up computing an expression for the, this gradient, but again, it's highly non-trivial. So what we end up doing in practice for our simplest algorithm for training um, a quantum Boltzmann machine in practice is what we do is we use a variational bound on the training objective function. So instead of training with respect to the relative entropy, what we do is we upper bound the relative entropy and compute the gradient of this. And we use an upper bound that get that uh, where the global minima, i.e. zero, ends up course uh, being equal in both cases. So if we just follow this variational bound down to its minima, well, we guarantee that if we hit that point, then it'll coincide with the lower bound uh, with the objective function. And so that's the idea. And the particular way that we do this is we use Jensen's inequality in order to be able to interchange the roles of the traces. 
Then <clears throat> when we end up going, going through this, we end up getting this incredibly nice looking expression for the gradient. I guess you're muted, so I can't hear all of your laughter. Um, but um, in any case, <clears throat> this, um, this result is actually the natural analog, if I go back, of the case that Marika and I uh, derived years ago for the gradient in the case where we had all visible. If you recall, it was the difference between the expectation value of the term under the model and the uh, expectation value of the corresponding term under the data that we we're, we're training with. Now we've got the difference between We've got a similar difference between these uh, these two terms. However, the main difference is that our Hamiltonian now has to end up getting shifted over to this H tilde. Uh, and this is a side effect of just using Jensen's inequality. So we learn kind of an effective Hamiltonian. And once we've done that, then we can train the gradient. And so this works great. And actually we can end up getting a, um, a uh, cost for the number of queries uh, needed um, to be able to uh, solve the problem. So what we did here is we got around the problem that uh, was mentioned before. We said, okay, let's assume that we have an oracle that's capable of computing the non-zero matrix elements of our Hamiltonian. Furthermore, let's end up assuming that our um, uh, Hamiltonian is um, is uh, desparse. Then, under those circumstances, we can actually upper bound the cost of the, of the Gibbs state preparation and uh, and everything else. And then, once we end up doing this, we end up getting a result that does depend on the um, value of the partition function, unfortunately, but it ends up uh, depending scaling only quadratically with the number of units in the model and linearly with the number of parameters. So this shows that actually the cost of this learning protocol, it really isn't all that bad. And uh, the way that it ends up working is basically it uses a liberal amount of amplitude estimation in order to be able to compute the expectation values that I showed you on the other side and uses techniques from linear combinations of unitaries in order to prepare the Gibbs states. Uh, any questions before I continue? Yeah, I thought this was pretty clear too, so cool. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the next approach is that this part over here, what we did is we used Jensen's inequality to do this. And as I said before, what that means is we're training with respect to a variational upper bound. So if we wanted to train according to the true objective function, the question is, well, how much more expensive would that end up being? And so the expression that we end up getting when we compute the, um, um, the true derivative is a much messier uh, expression. It's this form over here where we've got a sum that we've got to uh, compute over a bunch of different, different indices. And then we have to compute this trace of the density matrix up against all of these other unitaries. So we had to figure out ways of doing, doing this. And basically the approach that we ended up doing is we ended up using finite differences in order to be able to kind of approximate uh, everything. And we used um, linear, um, yeah, we used linear combinations of unitaries in order to implement all of these sums directly on a quantum computer. When we put all of the, these things together, the, everything becomes much, much worse. So, the scaling ends up going um, kind of like uh, one over epsilon to the third power as opposed to one over epsilon. And it ends up going like the number of hidden units to the fifth power uh, as opposed to third. So that it makes this, this approach much more expensive. But a nice feature about this approach is that if you're worried that we're giving up a lot of slack, with that variational bound that was used in the kind of cheaper version of this uh, training algorithm, then it shows that you can get around this and exactly uh, compute the, the gradient. So these are two examples of training algorithms that we can use in order to be able to train 
arbitrary Boltzmann machines with hidden units and not obscuring the costs of preparing the Gibbs states. So that is, that is basically it. So, oh, I, I guess this, these conclusions needed to be changed a little bit, but in any case, it, what we ended up um, showing in this, uh, in this talk is we showed really the first end-to-end -end algorithm for training quantum Boltzmann machines with visible and hidden units. We ended up seeing that actually the role of hidden units in quantum neural networks is much more subtle than we ended up believing previously. And in fact, actually, there's good reason why, in many cases, it might be a good idea to conceptually end up separating the notion of hid hidden and visible units in quantum computers and come up with techniques in order to limit the growth of entanglement in the hidden units, lest we in uh, artificially introduce decoherence that causes all of our models to, to suck. And so while we've, we've uh, done all of, all of this, there's a number of things that still are kind of left on the table. The first is, what are the most practical ways of us preparing the Gibbs states that these methods are based on? And furthermore, do we actually need the Gibbs states? Further work uh, might be able to demonstrate that we can get the same benefits of training with respect to the relative entropy without assuming that we have an exponential dis distribution. That would allow us to do exactly the same things that we're doing here, but with simpler uh, onsatses or simpler models, such as a trotterized sequence. So those are some of the open questions. Uh, other ones are, what role or how, how significant are these problems of a gradient decay going to end up being for generic uh, feed-forward neural networks? And to what extent could generative models such as this one help deal with many of these barren plateau issues because of their ability to follow the gradients of the relative entropy rather than just the direct training objective function? And by studying these and looking at how we can end up coming up with better and better ways of learning models for systems, we not only come up with better approaches to generate data on quantum computers, we also actually uh, also come up with unique ways of coming up with approximate cloners on quantum computers, and also have a new way of kind of gaining partial tomographic insights about the structure of the quantum states that we're train, uh, training on. And it, it's my hope that these sorts of techniques will actually end up leading to potentially the first kind of practical speed ups uh, from quantum machine learning algorithms. Um, well, they may not necessarily be for the billion dollar applications that we have at the moment, coming up with ways for us to be able to actually understand and predict what's going on in complex quantum states in the long run might even actually be necessary for us to build and understand the quantum computers will need for other applications. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Nathan. Uh, so people ask a few questions during the talk, but do we have more questions now? Uh, if you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, I have one more question. So, I guess I wouldn't um, quite understand so the solution to this decoherence problem that you're uh, solving. Like the result you're, you're, you're presenting is um, like bounds on prepared states and it is, yeah. like it's a very, very different uh, problem that- um, This is actually, yeah, you're right. It's a different problem. The, the second step is computing the value of the gradient. Yeah, that, that part is it's going too quickly wasn't quite sure what's happening. So I guess it's a very important problem that you can solve the decoherence problem and, and how right. have you, can you, can you yeah. see? More? And so basically the, the whole idea behind it, the way that we end up solving it is just by choosing our, uh, a less general family of Hamiltonians. So specifically what we do is we pick all of our Hamiltonians to have hidden 
uh, Hamiltonians and interaction Hamiltonians that commute with each other. So for example, you know, let's take a look at, at this case, which is the simplest uh, one that I could think of, right? In this particular case, I chose the hidden Hamiltonian to be diagonal. So it's just a bunch of poly Z operations, like we would see with an ordinary Boltzmann machine. The interaction Hamiltonian, on the other hand, um, ends up also ha being of the form um, poly Z on the visible and the hidden, but the visible Hamiltonian actually is not of that form. It's got off diagonal terms on the visible part. So you can see in this case, because this is diagonal and that's diagonal, H int commutes with HH, but it doesn't commute with HV. And you can show, uh, working through this, that the eigenvectors are actually, uh, can be written as tensor products between the hidden space and the visible space. And because they end up forming a tensor product, what that ends up meaning is that um, when we do the partial trace over the um, hidden units, all of the vectors in the thermal state that we end up getting when we represent it in the eigenbasis aren't going to be individually decohered. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the argument uh, for, uh, for uh, how we get around the problem. And it's a separate problem, to the problem of uh, computing the gradient. Uh, actually, I should say maybe a related problem rather than separate, because if the values of the gradient are exponentially small, like we would expect in a case where the hidden units are decohering everything out, then we'd need a much smaller value of epsilon in order to be able to uh, figure out how to move. And um, that is, uh, uh, that's why we take this. So it's kind of an uncoupled problem. The general solution is you design like commuting Hamiltonians for the hidden part and, and general Hamiltonians for the input. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. Hi, Nathan. Hey, mate. Hey, um, I just wanted to get a uh, follow up from that question. So I guess a way of thinking about the hidden units is it's like having um, like an oracle call to like a reversible, you know, a reversible circuit or something like that in a normal sort of circuit model. Um, it's like you have like a scratch work, a set of scratch working qubits. Yeah. Of, yeah. You know, working on a different register. I guess. Yeah. Except the difference is, is that we're not, we're not necessarily cleaning up those scratch registers and we're just tracing over them. Yeah. Okay, cool. And so then, you know, it's totally intuitive what ends up, what would end up happening if we, we ended up doing that with the ordinary circuit model. Yeah. And the, the fact that it's all, commuting is such that the symmetry protects you from, from the, yes. the decoherence, yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah. Um, okay, so if there are any more questions, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Nathan for his talk. Cool, and thanks a lot, Marika, for inviting me. Uh, of course, Nathan, thanks for accepting. <laughs>